Coming up, a surprising announcement from SeaWorld this past Thursday. Will we say bye-bye to Shamu? Also, Republican presidential candidate Marco Rubio dropped out of the race this week. Find out why and what he had to say about everyone's favorite orange man, Donald Trump. And a member of Orange Residents Say Neighbors Say No is here with us live in the studio to talk about Chapman expansion. Stay right here on Chapman News. Welcome to our spring break edition of Chapman News. I'm your host, Zach Shucklin. And I'm Simone Buteau. But joining us in the studio today is David Cordero, a spokesperson for Neighbors Say No, a movement among Orange residents against Chapman University's expansion. David, how are you today? Doing well. Thank you so much for joining us. Good to be here. Now, my first question, David, is why do you hate fun? Well, first, I actually want to thank the uh, the students of Chapman for uh, not having any blackouts on people's front lawns uh, during the St. Patrick's Day on Thursday. I, I, that was a big, uh, big accomplishment, and it shows that we're making moves in the right direction. Very commendable. <laughs> I, I would like to say that we are. Um, but um, I guess you're familiar with Chapman's specific plan that was put on hold indefinitely. Mm -hmm. um, for those of you who aren't aware, Chapman has proposed to develop 17 more acres of land that the school owned, as well as add 3,000 more students. And Orange was like, no, we're not about that. Can you tell me a little more about this? Sure. Um, we, uh, we're concerned about the, the rate of growth that's occurring um, with the university um, beyond the point which we originally had understood was going to be the ultimate build out and student population cap that the university and the city came to agreement on. Um, just about a decade ago, the student population here at Chapman was only about 5,000. It's now about uh, 8,600, um, and the cap, I believe, right now is 8,750. Um, what we're looking at now with this new proposal is to go beyond that ultimate build-out that the university had originally um, envisioned and now growing it to over 11,000 students. Um, Chapman has done uh, many great things for the community and as an institution of learning, I mean, it's, it's growing and becoming more respected around the world. And that's a good thing for the university, it's a good thing for Orange, it's a good thing for our education system. Um, the concern we have, though, is the fact that we're dealing with a lot of, of neighborhood issues, mm -hmm. um, in large part, because of the, the student growth and the housing issue. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that right now the university only has about uh, the capacity for 2,000 students to actually live in university proper housing. The rest are going into other parts of the city of Orange looking for places to live. And there's a lack of oversight then to make sure that um, a certain code of conduct and courtesy is extended in these neighborhoods where they're living. But one of the things that was pointed out in the Chapman specific plan is that on the acres that they were going to develop, they wanted to provide more upper upperclassmen housing. Mm -hmm. But that was one of the things that I guess you weren't in agreement with. Do you know why? Well, what we need to see first before we approve a plan to increase the student population even further is to see that the problems that we're currently facing with the current ultimate build-out cap, make sure those are being taken care of first and foremost, and then look at how do we go from there if the university does in fact want to grow the student population further. Our goal is to make sure that we have quality students living in our communities, and quantity is not what we're really going for as residents and homeowners. But isn't that isn't quality students up to admissions, not the Orange County residents. Well, we look at quality certainly as the caliber that would be admitted to the university, but also good citizens and people that are, are courteous and mm -hmm. realize that they are part of a larger community and that they have a vested interest in helping us keep Orange uh, in the way that we are accustomed to having it. I know the concerns have been raised from noise to uh, traffic to overcrowding, but there's also a flip side about that. Hasn't Chapman done a lot of great things for the community? Um, there's a lot of restaurants that are opening in the downtown Orange Circle. Um, Without Chapman, do you think it's fair to say that there probably just would have been antique stores? Also, homeowners are getting um, property incentives for living closer to the um, university campus, um, as well as just the economic development and infrastructure that's undergone the city of Orange. Does, does that not account for anything? Well, I think we've seen Orange go through a, a metamorphosis over the last 10 years. Uh, you're, you're right in the fact that uh, you know antique stores was kind of what Orange, and especially in Old Town, was, was known for. Uh, previously. Uh, we've seen a lot of, of economic development, new restaurants coming in, new stores, and that's been a good thing. Um, is it directly attributable to the expansion of the university? 
I, I find it hard to believe it's, it would be driven strictly by the fact that there are more college students in the, mm -hmm. the community. I think there are a lot of business owners that saw Orange and the changes it was going through. A business-friendly city council that was more welcoming and, and open to new types of businesses and a revitalization that really spurned the decisions by these business owners to come and, and open, open their doors here in Orange. Certainly, they're helped by the, the students as, mm. as they patronize the, the restaurants in particular. Um, but we also have to keep in mind the fact that um, during the breaks of, in you know, the, the school year when you guys are uh, on winter break, spring break, or during the summer when the, the student population has, you know, has left the area, these businesses are, are still you know, staying filled, still doing good business. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of orange residents and people from other areas that are coming and patronizing these, these establishments. All right. Well, thank you, David. Up next, we have David joining us on our panel, along with Chapman SGA President Austin Kernan. Stay tuned. Follow your For dreams. Sure. Now we're gonna Chapman University. Take your life to new heights. Chapman University. Invest your humanity. Lead. Follow your dreams. Chapman University. History, philosophy, peace studies, languages. Study abroad and explore the world. Become a global citizen. The Wilkinson College at Chapman University. Invest your humanity. Lead. Welcome back. We are going to continue the discussion between the Orange residents and the Chapman University expansion conflict. We have David Cordero continuing to join us, as well as our SGA president-elect, Austin Kernan. Um, now, you guys, I wanted to kick it off. Uh, it's great that we have both of you guys to have some conflicting viewpoints. Um, if you guys could start by identifying the main um, pe people that you represent, as well as what your current views are on uh, the noise ordinance, as well as the expansion and the current conflict between you both. Can I start with you, Austin? Sure. Um, so as of this past week, I was recently elected the Student Government Association president. and. Um, my main representation will be the undergraduate students of the Chapman University population, representing about nearly a little over 6,000 students. Um, as a whole, the representation comes down to both students who live on campus and off campus. Um, this noise ordinance is addressing something that, strangely enough, hasn't actually been brought up just very recently. This has been an ongoing issue in the past, really since 1991, since the ordinance was initially created. Um, back in 1991, when Chapman College became Chapman University itself, um, the issues they're addressing um, are, are very pertinent and seem reasonable to address the fact that, you know, there's some discomfort between neighbors and there's a lack of communication between the two. The big thing that I want to address is really find the justification behind the large expansion between it coming from 72 hours back in 2009 when it was proposed to 2012, it, being 70, it going from 72 hours to 10 days, and then the large gap of the June 30th. Um, I think the big like, clarification point to make is just to understand that while I get that we're trying to work together, we didn't want to feel targeted as a whole that the city of Orange wants to concentrate and cap and really strike down Chapman by putting in the June 30th. We just wanted to like provide any clarification if, if necessary. Thank you, Austin. Um, now again, the same question to David, kind of what are the main viewpoints of the people that you represent? Okay. Well, Neighbors Say No is a... Um a grassroots organization. We are neighbors, we are homeowners, we are businesses that uh, are concerned about the ra rate of growth of the Chapman University student community and making sure that uh, the concerns that we've, we've had over the last few years and that have been growing and uh, increasing over time uh, are addressed before any further expansion occurs uh, with the university and its student population. Um, we had before a, an agreement between the city and the university that there would be a firm cap of uh, students at uh, 8,700. And now the university has sought to uh, go beyond that ultimate build out that they had built it as previously and expanded to uh, over 11,650, I think, is what they're requesting. 
Um, before we, we consider uh, moving forward with that type of additional student growth, we want to make sure that the, the challenges that we're facing in our neighborhoods are being addressed, as well as just looking at the overall growth plan of the university and making sure that it is consistent with what, uh, what our city is, is based upon and what our, what our values are. Uh, we've had a great relationship with the university and we've had a great relationship with, uh, with the students over the years. Uh, sadly, what we're dealing with right now is a situation where there are a few bad actors that unfortunately taint the reputation, which is otherwise really stellar, of uh, the Chapman University student community. And we want to make sure that uh, the best possible plan goes forward and that we see that uh, the university and the students are taking it upon themselves to address some of these concerns that have uh, broader implications on our neighborhoods here in Orange. Mm -hmm. If I could just jump in there. Yeah. Um, You've mentioned that you have a great relationship with the university, but on the website of uh, Neighbors Say No, the headline says, Stop Chapman. Does addressing parties by restricting them, isn't that only going to make students look more apathetic towards their neighbors, more angry? I know you went to a dry campus, but Chapman is what they consider a moist campus when they take <laughs> you on an admissions tour. Um, Education goes without saying, but lots of kids come to college to have these, these parties experiences. By negating those, aren't you going to create a little more, um, some more enemies? Well, I will say this much. Um, parties are going to happen, whether you're a college student or, you know, or beyond. It's a matter of you do things responsibly and you do things respectfully. And students here at Chapman University, I think, need to realize that when they're living in these residential neighborhoods uh, throughout our city, it's not even just here in Old Town, but throughout the city of Orange, um, there is a certain personal responsibility that they take to make sure they're being neighborly and that they're taking steps to um, make sure that they're communicating on their own proactively with those that are living around them. Uh, Austin and I had a chance to talk off camera before the, the interview, and um, I will say this much, with him coming in as your next student body president, um, I think you've got a great leader here who recognizes the, the challenges that the university and the community here in Orange is facing and is looking to you know, bridge the gaps and, and really find areas where we can find common ground and, and solutions that are going to work for everybody. Um, yeah. And so I, you know, I just want to call upon you know, the students viewing and everyone else to you know, really be supportive of your incoming president because I think he's really going to do a lot of great things um, in the coming year. Definitely. I think we definitely elected Austin for a reason and made the right decision. I agree. Um, we do only have time for one more question. I wanted to end it off with kind of um, looking towards the future. If I could direct the question to Austin first. I know you won't be here in 10 years. Um, but you may be in the area. Where do you see the residents and the environment um, going if, if you were to see like a perfect situation for Chapman Uni University 10 years down the road? So I definitely feel that as we stand today, we're always looking at plans of expansion. There's always opportunities to improve. And I really do see us improving. But what I see us improving on is not only like tangibly with our physical space, but also too with our relationships with our community. I definitely am proud of the fact that the Musco Center will be having a community day in early April, and that event will really be encompassing not only the students of Chapman University, but the community as a whole. That's a great opportunity that we really need to capitalize on. But I think another big opportunity that we need to take in is the opportunity for better relationships with our neighbors. I think that we need to take this more as a proactive stance rather than reactive, and not really create a bigger gap between the two parties, because I really feel that we need to meet a middle ground here. And I was talking with Dave earlier about this, that while we understand that parties are inevitable, it can't be really be concentrated and ultimately like removed. That's just, it can't happen at the end of the day. But what we can do is we can establish better relationships with our neighbors to come to saying, okay, let's have an agreement to where if the noise level gets too high, give us a call, we'll take care of it. If not, then you have every right to go ahead and call the police on us. That's our agreement. It has to happen prior to anything because what's happening now is neighbors are becoming reactive and now there's this big gap between, well, now they want to create organizations such as Neighbors Say No as a reactive stance to it, whereas we failed to have prior communication with our neighbors and the residents of the community. As a whole, what I see us becoming in the future is a bigger organization with more space and more students, but I feel us also with, um, I feel us, we're all going to uh, come together as a family. That's really what I see us as 10 years down the road. Great, thank you so much, Austin. Now, if we could just get a few final words from you, David. All right, well, again, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and uh, to represent the, the homeowners and, and residents here in Orange. Um, ultimately, I think what we're looking at here, and I think Austin really hit it you know, on the head, um, it's finding common ground and it's looking to, uh, I think, improve the relations that exist uh, between the homeowners and, and the students who are living uh, in, in Orange. And uh, I think it's certainly nothing that can, uh, 
it can't be overcome. I think we're, we're heading in the right direction. I think we've got the right people um, on our city council, uh, your student government, and, and also the university administration. Um, and working with us in good faith, and I feel that the university ultimately will will do so, and will continue to build upon the the you know excellent relationship we've enjoyed with the, with them over the years. Um, you know, we're grateful to have Chapman here. Uh, we just want to make sure that ultimately anything that happens moving forward is is uh, balanced and, and fits in within the 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 tradition and history and and uh, you know the values of, of our city. Great. I think if there's one thing that we identified here today, it's that there is a middle ground. It's just a matter of reaching it. Um, I want to thank you guys both so much for coming in again. Yeah, thank thank you. you so much. Of course. Uh, SeaWorld announced Thursday that it will be doing away with its killer whale breeding program. In total, the park's 24 remaining whales will be their last generation of orcas. These marine mammals were born at SeaWorld and raised in captivity. SeaWorld president and CEO Joel Manby told LA Times if the whales were released in the wild, they would most likely not survive. The park has plans for expansion to build an enclosure for the whales that better resembles their natural habitats. Last year, SeaWorld announced they would begin phasing out their famous Shamu shows after much pressure from the documentary Blackfish that argued harmful effects of keeping whales in captivity. Manby added that the changing public opinion and attitude towards orcas played a large role in the park's decision. This past Tuesday, Republican Party presidential candidate Marco Rubio dropped out of the race for president. Rubio was a senator representing the state of Florida in the House of Representatives in the past and was the youngest candidate running for the Republican Party nod. He made the decision to do so after losing his home state of Florida to billionaire Donald Trump. After announcing that he was dropping out of the race, Rubio said Trump was smart and he has got a great future, while others were calling the most popular neo-Nazi to run for president yet. Up next, Nicole Renard is in the studio with one of her very own original recipes. That's right, and you know I've actually had this dish of hers, and let me tell you, everyone in the studio here who's going to get to try it, it's a real treat. Stay tuned. One in 13,200,000. Odds of being struck by lightning, one in 576,000. Odds of dating a supermodel, one in 88,000. Odds of bowling a perfect game, one in 11,500. Odds of being trapped in an elevator, one in 24,528. Odds of catching a ball at a major league game, one in 563. Odds of an injury from shaving, 1 in 6,585. Odds of tripping while texting, 1 in 10. Odds of getting cancer in your lifetime, 1 in 2 men, 1 in 3 women. It's up to us to change the odds for our generation. For the ones we love. For our future. If you don't like the odds, stand up. Stand up to cancer. warning and often occur while you are away from home. Be ready for emergencies by registering your alternate phone numbers, cell phones, and email addresses at alertoc.com. You will receive alerts when an emergency occurs near your workplace or neighborhood. Reporters and Miss City of Orange loves to bake and she's here to show us one of her original recipes. That's right, and I would highly recommend trying this one for yourself at home. Nicole? Hey everyone, welcome to the cooking segment of the spring special show. My name is Nicole Renard, and today I'm going to be showing you how to make a little recipe I like to call, you're going to love it. Now I've got a little bit of southern blood in me, so um, if you've ever had the dessert banana pudding, this is my special twist of banana pudding. It's called Southern California banana pudding. And so what we're gonna do, I have taken a whole package of golden Oreos here, crushed them up, mixed them with some melted butter to create a really nice, yummy um, golden Oreo crust, and I've placed it down here in the pan. And then what I have done is taken um, a little bit of cream cheese, powdered sugar, and Cool Whip, and I am mixing it in this bowl, and this is gonna be the second layer. So we are going to add this. 
top of the golden Oreos. This makes a nice creamy layer. We're gonna smooth it out all over those yummy Oreos. This dessert is so easy, it's so quick. You're gonna see how quickly you can prepare this and you don't even need to bake it, which is awesome because you can you know, use the microwave to melt the butter and then really after that, there is no baking involved. So this is for all of you who don't think you're good at baking, I'm gonna help you be good at baking. Okay, so we got that layer down, yum. Now we're going to take um, some chopped bananas and you are going to layer them on top of the cream cheese layer. This part is fun because everybody loves the bananas. This kind of makes me um, feel like this dessert should be something you know you eat at the beach or something during the summer because the fruitiness and the creaminess is just really refreshing. Definitely a crowd pleaser. Add some bananas. You know, what I love about this recipe is that it's so versatile. I've also made it um, as a peanut butter version. So I use peanut butter cookies for the crust and then um, I use a chocolate pudding and sprinkle some peanut butter cookies and chocolate chips on the top. You could also do a, um, a, a chocolate version with chocolate Oreos on the bottom with chocolate pudding as well and Oreo cookies on the top. This is my vanilla version. But you can also do birthday cake. So you can add some cake mix Give it that little funfetti flair everyone loves. Lovely, okay. So our whole top here is covered with bananas. Now for the next layer, um, we're gonna do some vanilla pudding. But to add a little bit of fun to this vanilla pudding, I put some cinnamon in because cinnamon and bananas with the vanilla just taste so good. So I've, I'm using this whisk to get all my ingredients mixed in and get that cinnamon nice and dissolved. And we're gonna pour the pudding over the top of the bananas until it's nice and covered. I love this whisk. It has a little rubber thing on the side where you can like scrape the side of your bowl so you make sure you get everything out. Awesome. There is the pudding, and then you're gonna stick that in the fridge, and once that sets up, you are gonna come back and top the rest with some Cool Whip. So we're gonna place this on the top like so. Spread it around. Usually your pudding will be a little bit more set up than mine, so your Cool Whip will go on a little easier. But you know, we're making it work. Nothing a little fridge and some chilling can't handle. All right, so once we get all of this spread out, it's coming along here. I never make a recipe without using Ghirardelli chocolate. Those of you that know my recipes know that I always use Ghirardelli. I'm the Ghirardelli girl, I love Ghirardelli chocolate. And so we're gonna leave that there for now. We're gonna take my favorite Ghirardelli chocolate Form into a little cup. And we're going to sprinkle them on the top. So 
when you pop this in the fridge, everything will set up. It will be nice and delicious, perfect for a spring break barbecue, something to bring to a birthday party. It's sure to um, please everybody in the crowd. Every item that I used here today was coming from this cool company called Joseph Joseph. They create lots of cool kitchenware that makes cooking easy to use for everyone. And so if you give them a follow at Joseph Joseph Official on Instagram, um, also you can use my promo code DoStuff10 to receive 10% off of your order at Joseph Joseph. Definitely check out their products. They've got lots of cool things like this spatula that um, is elevated so when you put it down, it's not gonna touch the countertop and nothing gets dirty. All right, I hope you enjoy this recipe. If you wanna find the full recipe, just head to dostuffblog.wordpress.com and you can make it for all your friends. We're gonna to toss it over to Simone for more on the spring break special. Thank you, Nicole. This week marks the kickoff for March Madness. Our sports specialist, Cam Backstrom, and special commentary guest, Ella Miller, are here in the studio with updates. Thanks, guys. Well, coming up on our Chapman News Spring Special, we have all the madness you can want. I'm Cameron Baxter. I'm Ella Miller. Stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> right. Stand up for what's right. Chapman University. Passion, perseverance, teamwork, integrity. Create value in the world. The School of Law at Chapman University. Lead. Follow your dreams. Chapman University. Chemistry, physics, computational science, biology. Start doing research in your first year. Soar to new heights. The Schmidt College of Science at Chapman University. Explore. Welcome back. Well, the madness is here as the NCAA March Madness Tournament kicked off yesterday with 16 games. And as expected, there were a few big upsets. Let's dive right into that action. So as you can see, number 21 here, Teron Prince hit the three. It was a close game in the final minute. And, but, excuse me, Baylor and Yale were going at it. And number three... Jake Lindsay had the, had the bucket, and with 30 seconds to go, number 11, Lester Medford had the chance, and with six seconds left, Baylor has the chance to win the game, but he loses the ball and loses the game, and Yale goes to upset. And another big upset of the day was the Little Rock Trojans against the Purdue Boilermaker. Boilermaker. Purdue got off a hot start, but the Trojans clawed back with a series of clutch shots within the final minutes. Lish Soshi comes up with a big three in the corner. But in the final seconds of the game, it was senior Josh Hagens who had a career 31 points. In overtime, we see that it was a back-to-back -back battle between both teams. And although Little Rock had the final shot off, it seemed that it was nowhere near the rim. Now we get into double overtime where things start to get real exciting. And the fans are on the edge of their seat. Nothing says March Madness like an upset. So we saw again, it was a Josh Hagen's show with a beautiful pass to the corner for a three and off to a circus shot good for two. Yet again, another Cinderella story has Little Rock winning 85 to 83. What a good game. And we both have brackets. We do. It, we're, we are the Bractology Masters. And mm -hmm. we have two final scores that came through. Syracuse upset Dayton 70-51. to 51, Yes, and thankfully I had that one. I did not have it, unfortunately. And Oklahoma, or excuse me, Oregon State lost to VCU. Another upset again, 75-67. Yeah, that one will affect my bracket, so I'm not sure where we stand now. Uh, but I think the best part about March Madness is that you really can't know what's going to happen. I think the upsets are really what fans look forward to. And... I think there's definitely been a lot this year already. I know, and I'm I'm only at 48% correct. I was at 70 yesterday. It just drops down. It keeps getting worse, but I have Kansas winning. I believe you have Kansas winning. I do. I have Kansas winning along with the rest of the country, it seems. Uh, Michigan State is another popular pick. North Carolina. Um, Obama actually has Kansas winning. So, I mean, if there's one thing that I can do right in my life is to pick the same pick as Obama. So I agree. We'll see. But um, in chief. Yeah, but I, I think it's going to be an interesting year. Uh, as do I. A lot of upsets so far. Well, guys, that's all we have. I'm Cameron Backstrom. I'm Ellen Miller. Thanks for tuning in. Back to you guys at the desk.
Frank Sinatra Jr. was kidnapped again Thursday, this time by the Grim Reaper. Oh. <laughs> a German shepherd was rescued after falling off of his owner's boat and nearly five weeks of being lost at sea. His owners were quoted saying that there's not really any words that can describe it. This is not a day we thought would ever happen, said the dog, Wilson. <laughs> Once again, SeaWorld announced yesterday that it would be ending its orca breeding program to take a new direction. But believe it or not, not everyone was happy with the news. Before they could finish their announcement, they were interrupted by protesters from Black Whales Matter. <laughs> Trouble in North Korea. 21-year-old UVA student Otto Warmbier was sentenced to 15 years of hard labor after attempting to steal a flag from a hotel in the capital Pyongyang. His exact punishment? Picking things off the top shelf. <laughs> Fifteen years of hard labor. Boy, their pledge process is tough. <laughs> Marco Rubio pulled out, yes, out Tuesday. Thankfully, Hillary's tests came back negative. <laughs> Marco Rubio dropped out of the presidential race after losing to Donald Trump in Rubio's home state, Florida. Said Donald Trump, I will definitely endorse Marco Rubio for president. <laughs> Marco Rubio's campaign has been dying for months, which makes it surprising that Florida voters could not connect with that. <laughs> <laughs> Log on to our website, chapmannews.tv, to see all of our episodes, Chapman Newsies bios, and top headlines. And make sure you also follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Chapman News, Twitter and Instagram at Chapman News, and YouTube at youtube.com slash Chapman News. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We will be back after spring break. Thank you guys for coming.